difference for human beings will just be a prejudice. If we've given any reason at all so far for these preferences, it's simply the one we express by saying, it's a human being, or they're human, or she's one of us. And that, the objectors say, isn't a reason. They'll remind us of the paradigm prejudices, racism and sexism. Because he's white, because he's male, are no good in themselves as reasons, though they can be relevant in very special circumstances. For instance, gender in the case of employing a bathroom attendant, though even that might be thought in some circles to involve a further prejudice. If the supposed reasons of race or gender are offered without support, he's a man, he's white, the answer they elicit is, quite rightly, what's that got to do with it? Those supposed reasons are equally of the form, he's one of us, for a narrower us. Well, the objectors say, the human privilege is itself just another prejudice, like racism or sexism, and they have a suitably unlovely name for it, speciesism. Well, now, how good is this objection? And how exactly does it work? <clears throat> Well, I'm afraid it'll take a little while to answer those questions because they require us to try to get a bit clearer about the relations between our humanity on the one hand and our giving and understanding reasons on the other, and the route to that involves several stops. A good place to start, I think, is this. Not many racists or sexists have actually supposed that a bare appeal to race or gender merely saying he's black or she's a woman, did constitute a reason. They were, to, so to speak, at a stage either earlier or later than that. It was earlier if they simply had a barely articulated practice of discrimination. They just went on like that, and they didn't need to say anything to their like-minded companions in the way of justification of their practices. Well, the day came when they did have to say something in justification to those discriminated against if they couldn't simply go on telling them to shut up, to outsiders or to radicals, or to themselves in those moments when they started to wonder how defensible it might be. And then they had to say some more. Mere references to race or gender wouldn't meet what was by then the need. Equally, references to supernatural sources, which said the same thing, wouldn't hold up for long. Something which at least seemed relevant to the matter at hand, uh, job opportunities, the franchise, or whatever it might be, something would have to be brought out about the supposed intellectual and moral weakness, say, of blacks or women. Well, these were reasons in the sense that they're at least to some degree of the right shape to be reasons, though, of course, they were very bad reasons, both because they were untrue and because they were the products of false consciousness, working to hold up the system, and it didn't need any very elaborate social or psychological theory to show that they were. Well, now, with the case of the supposed human prejudice, it doesn't seem to be quite like this. On the one hand, it isn't simply a matter of inarticulate or unexpressed discrimination. There's no secret that we're in favour of human rights, for instance. On the other hand, it's a human being does seem to operate as a reason, but it doesn't seem to be helped out by some further reach of supposedly more relevant reasons of the kind which in the other cases of prejudice turned out to be rationalisations or false consciousness. We're all aware of some notable differences between human beings and other creatures on Earth. But there's a whole range of cases in which we cite or rely on the fact that a certain creature is a human being, but where those differences between us and other animals don't seem to figure in our thought as justifications for going on as we do. In fact, in many cases, it's hard to see how they could. Uniquely on Earth, human beings use highly articulated languages. They've developed to an unparalleled extent non-genetic learning through culture. They possess literatures and historically cumulative technologies, and so on. Well, now, of course, there's quite a lot of dispute about the exact nature and extent of these differences between our own and other species. There's discussions, for instance, of how far some other primates 
transmit learned skills and whether they have local traditions in this. But this isn't the point. There is on any showing a sharp and spectacular behavioural gap between ourselves and our nearest primate relatives. And that's no doubt because other hominid species have disappeared, doubtless with our assistance. But why should considerations about those differences, true as they are, about culture and technology and language and all that, why should those differences play any role at all in an argument about vegetarianism, for instance? What's all that stuff about language and culture and so on got to do with human beings eating some other animals but not human beings? It's hard to see any argument in that direction which won't turn out to say something like this, that it's simply better that culture, intelligence and technology should flourish as opposed presumably to all those other amazing things that are done by other species which are on the menu. Or consider, if you like, not the case of meat-eating, but of insecticides. If we have reason to use insecticides, must we claim that it's simply better that we should flourish at the expense of the insect? If any evolutionary development is spectacular and amazing, it's the proliferation and diversification of insects. Some of them are harmful to human beings, their food or their artifacts, but they are truly wonderful. What these last points show is that even if we could get hold of the idea that it was just better that one sort of animal should flourish rather than another, it's not in the least clear why it should be us. But the basic point, of course, is that we can't get hold of that idea at all. That's simply another recurrence of the notion we saw off a little while ago, absolute importance, that last relic of the still enchanted world. Of course, we can say rightly that we're in favour of cultural development and so on and think it's very important, but that itself is just another expression of the human prejudice we're supposed to be wrestling with. So there's something obscure about the relations between the moral consideration it's a human being and the characteristics that distinguish human beings from other creatures. If there's a human prejudice, it's structurally rather different from those other prejudices, racism and sexism. Well, now, this doesn't necessarily show it isn't a prejudice. Some critics will say, on the contrary, that it shows what a deep prejudice it is, to the extent that we can't even articulate reasons that are supposed to underlie it. And if, as I said, we seem very ready to profess it, the critic will say that this shows how shamelessly prejudiced we are, and we, that we can express it, we profess it, because, very significantly, there's no one we have to justify it to, except a few reformers who are fellow human beings. Well, that's certainly a significant fact, and we have to bear it in mind. Other animals on this planet are good at many things, but not at asking for or understanding justifications. Oppressed humans, women and minorities, <coughs> come of age in the search for emancipation when they speak for themselves and no longer through reforming members of the oppressing group. But the other animals will never come of age. Human beings will always act as their trustees. And that's connected to a point which I'll come back to, that in relation to those other animals, the only moral question for us is how we should treat them, a point that I say I shall come back to. <coughs> Now, someone who speaks vigorously against speciesism and the human prejudice is, of course, Professor Peter Singer, the Ira W. D. Camp Professor of Bioethics in this very university. And I'm sorry, as I gather, that he's away at this time and can't be with us. Indeed, as you don't need telling here, he holds his chair at the said University Center for Human Values, at least I believe he does, which I've already mentioned. And I have wondered, I must say, what he makes of that name. In the purely possessive or limp sense of the expression, it's presumably all right, but in the richer sense of the expression human values, which must surely be its intention, I thought it would have sounded to him rather like a center for Aryan values. Well, 
Whatever exactly may be the structure of the human prejudice, if it is a prejudice, singers